Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge with Marco Mangelsdorf. We haven't been together in a, in a while, so it's like a reunion. Hi, Marco. Hey there, Jay. Great to see you again, my friend. Let's take a look at what's going on in energy. Of course, that, that'd be appropriate for this show. Um, there are two kinds of articles that have appeared recently, two kinds of news threads that we ought to approach. Um, you know, one is that uh, seems like uh, green energy is, is, uh, is on the move nationally. Um, and there's more activity in green energy now than there was right here in the middle of COVID. And the other one, there's a, plenty of installation going on of solar systems here in Hawaii. Um, so this is, this is interesting. And I, I'd like to explore with you exactly what the metrics are for that and why, okay? Uh, so let's talk about Hawaii first, because you, you follow it very closely in Hawaii. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's riding the solar coaster, Jay, the solar coaster that I've been on uh, for more than 40 years overall, but especially more than 20 here in, uh, in the 808. And just kind of as a little bit of background, if you look at the, the numbers uh, from the mainland, uh, it looks to be that, uh, you know, we've got three quarters into our belt now of 2020. And uh, the numbers are down uh, for rooftop solar because I make a differentiation between rooftop solar and then big kind scale, utility scale solar. Uh, so for rooftop solar, depending on the region, but overall, it looks to be down 20 or 30 plus percent across the U.S. mainland. And California is the big, is the gold rush state, so to speak, in terms of solar, and their numbers have taken a big, big hit. So they're, they're seeing the, the COVID uh, effect uh, because, of course, solar electric systems are, are not trivial purchases. They're, they're big ticket items. Even if you finance it or you, you do a lease, it's still a substantial commitment. So switch back to the middle of the Pacific where we uh, are blessed to be, and I just crunched the numbers for the uh, first three quarters of this year, and across the state are rooftop solar PV numbers are up uh, 22% first nine months of this year compared to the first nine months of last year, which of course uh, causes me to be uh, uh, relieved to some degree. And uh, major players on Oahu are also having very strong years. And we're also seeing a record amount of storage, energy storage in the form of batteries, typically Tesla Powerwalls and uh, products from LG Chem. So uh, compared to what's going on in the, in the rest of the United States, we are an outlier, a good outlier in this regard, as far as more PV uh, going in by 22%, or at least in terms of permits, which is uh, one of the more easy to measure and kind of real-time metrics in terms of how we're, we're doing and we're, we're still, still going strong. So last year was an improvement over the past several years. And this year is an improvement over last year uh, what next year is going to be, who knows? We got a tax credit that's scheduled to go down further, uh, federal tax credit as of January 1st, but uh, that's a ways away. So, so far, so good. We're having uh, overall a good year in the solar industry here this year in the state. So you say 22%, that's 22% of the number of permits year over year or nine months over nine months. Across the state, right. If you aggregate the PV permit numbers for the four, there are actually five counties in Hawaii. Most people think there are four. And I'll bet you, could you even, could you name the fifth county, my friend? Mm, okay, there's Honolulu, Maui, the Big Island, that's three. There's Mo Molokai part of Maui, no. Correct. Mo Mo okay, there's uh, Kauai, and Ni'ihau, could it be Ni'ihau? No, no. Okay, I'll spare you. It is the uh, Kalawao, Kalawao, which is the Kaolapapa Peninsula on Maui. Uh, excuse me, what am I saying? The island of Molokai. So that is, uh, from what I, I was surprised to learn a number of years ago, they are a county in and of themselves, but uh, they're somehow subsumed under Maui County, but they're officially are a, are a county. Wow, very interesting piece. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, now if, if I if I took twenty two percent of the actual money contract that is spent for these projects, uh, would it would it be the same breakdown of twenty two percent? I mean, what I mean is uh, people spending more or less on a given project. Uh, that's a great question. It's it's actually about the same because, for example, last year there were a handful, uh, four actually, four projects that were utility scale. 
on the island of Oahu that skewed the overall project values number up by more than $100 million, more than $100 million. As far as I can tell this year so far, there are no such utility scale projects that have been permitted yet on Oahu. Uh, so there's, uh, there's that absence of, let's say, 100 plus million bucks. So if you take the 120 million from last year, uh, we're right about the same total project value uh, last year without the utility scale as we are this year. But you're including the, the, uh, the utility scale projects in the number. And so if there are some big projects coming along, I mean, big permits coming along between now and the end of the year, that would, uh, that would improve the 22%, right? It would. I don't think that's going to happen uh, uh, because the RFPs, the request for proposals, which Hawaiian Electric has been doing over the past several years for major utility scale, renewable energy, solar and storage, uh, they're still in the bureaucratic phase, from what I can tell, and are not close to breaking ground uh, this year, from what I, what I know, and I'm not sure about, about next year. Yeah. Uh, when you say bureaucratic, is that at the utility level or, or is that at the uh, Department of Planning and Permitting? Well, it's, I mean, it's a long grown up. When, once you start talking utility scale, you're talking about land use, more studies being done, more uh, players being involved. I mean, these are being developed by typically uh, outside of Hawaii companies. And it's just, uh, you know, from my, my perspective, it's just a much longer timeline to get these projects actually operating and in the ground. So the, uh, the reduction in the, in the tax credit, you're talking about federal tax credit. What's the reduction? Is it substantial? Is it enough to um, you know, uh, encourage me to go right away and discourage me from going later? Well, last year uh, was our last year at 30%. So this year it's 26%. Next year it's 22%. And depending on what happens uh, across the country in a short 15 days from now, as to whether we go uh, continue in the Donald Trump direction or, or go off into the Joe Biden direction will have an impact, I believe, on whether that tax credit, the investment tax credit is allowed to wind down as it's scheduled to now or whether, say, under a Biden administration, uh, which uh, purports to be more friendly towards renewable energy, that there would be a push in the part of the friends of solar, the friends of renewable energy in both the US House and Senate, and then with the Democrats in the White House, you know, I think it's reasonable to believe that there may very well be sometime for six months of next year, perhaps a, uh, a new tax credit, which would uh, stop the ramp down at a minimum and maybe push it up, who knows, who knows, it's hard to predict. Well, but, going back uh, to, a, I wanna cover that, but going back to the state. So we have a, a, a difference between the mainland um, you know, rooftop solar numbers, I guess, and, um, and Hawaii, why? What is it that's happening here uh, that differentiates us? What, what, what is affecting the process and consumer sentiment and the like? That's a great question. And uh, got all the years I've been doing this, Jay, you know, in terms of coming up with answers to your good questions, sometimes I left, I'm left kind of befuddled. I mean, why are we the outlier not that I'm complaining about being the outlier in this regard, but why are we the outlier? And I think uh, it's gotta be because we have some well entrenched PV players here, both local uh, here on this island, Maui, the Oahu, and we also have a number of entrenched, very active mainland players, Sunrun being one of them, Tesla being another, and there's no shortage of uh, aggressive pricing. There's no shortage of competition. And uh, there's no shortage of incentives, both from the federal tax credit perspective, the state tax credit perspective. And we're still dealing with uh, electric costs, uh, despite the cost of oil being 40 bucks or so on the world market and has been parked there for a while. We're still kind of more or less 3x or more depending on the island uh, of elect, uh, energy costs, electricity costs here. So it is continues to be a compelling, shall we say value proposition for those homeowners, those businesses who have yet to go solar electric for them to say, well, hmm, maybe it is time. 
and you know the tax credit will go down in the in, in next year uh, or apparently will go down so you know the psychology of uh, people jumping to take action when they fear they're going to lose something of value to them as opposed to there, that's even more of a motivator apparently than if i were to call you and say jay i got a hot tip for you you know buy uh, xyz stock because it's going to go up but if i if i tell you jay you better sell your some of your existing holdings because you're going to lose money if you don't you're probably going to be more 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 motivated to do the latter than the former yeah well let me let me throw a speculative theory at you and see what you think of my speculative theory okay <clears throat> first of all uh we're really talking about uh, residential um uh because you know a business uh, that has trouble you know uh, staying solvent is not going to go and uh, do do solar right now. Not not in COVID. I mean, it has a profound effect. And likewise, uh, people who have no money, who don't have jobs, or who are fear for their jobs, people who are you know living on CARES money, the like, uh, they're not going to do that. They're they're insecure at the, at the least, or they're desperate. They're not going to do that. So who is left? Well, it's the people who have some bucks stored away. The people who are not worried about uh, you know their ability to pay the bills and and buy what they need to buy, it's the people who are not uh, you know being forced to go to work. The people who who stay home. And my theory is that it's a nesting thing. If you stay home all day uh, without a whole lot to do, except maybe have talk shows you know with think tech maybe. Um, you, 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 you look around you, you look at your house and you say, hmm, you know, this is a time uh, to improve the house. This is a time to get, you know, chores that I wanted to do before done now so that when we come out of COVID, I'll be better prepared. Um, it's a kind of, um, it's nesting. It's attending to your home, to the home, to, to the home, the home experience. Um, Okay, and I think people must be having that experience. What do you think? I think that's a reasonable proposition. Yeah, and uh, I'll this maybe a good segue as well to one of the things I noted in my data crunching over the weekend is that on Oahu for last month, September, the Honolulu City and County Department of Planning and Permitting, uh, the percentage of all those PV system permits issued last month by DPP, 82%, 82% involved included energy storage. That was a record, Jay. I hadn't seen that. We were parking around the 70s, but 82%. So obviously more than four out of five people are going storage. And that by far, by far, by far is leading any market on the mainland in terms of storage deployed on a per household basis. So that to me as well over time especially i'm, I'm kind of actually surprised not that i'm disappointed but surprised that we haven't had more hurricanes rumbling through the mid-pacific uh, after a scare of what a couple months ago uh, but storage uh, adds to the reliability and resiliency not only of uh, a home that is going to be at least partially supplied with power in case the grid goes down but over time will strengthen the the, the robustness and the resiliency of the grid writ large. There was a great piece in Green Tech Media about what uh, uh, Green Mountain Power in Vermont uh, is has been doing with deploying thousands of Tesla power walls uh, through a program that they've supported to allow the utility company to, at their discretion when needed, to tap into these individual PV systems and Tesla power walls to support the grid writ large. And that's inevitably, man, that's inevitably where we're going yeah. uh, across the country, but especially where we need to go faster, further, deeper across our isolated uh, hurricane of vulnerable islands. So yeah. more and more storage going in. Yeah. But Green Mountain Power, is that, is that where our recent addition to the uh, Hawaiian Electric um, Board of Directors came from? Yeah, my friend Mary Powell uh, used to be longtime CEO, fantastic, fantastic person, uh, just uh, in all respects. And she retired the uh, about a year ago, well, December of last year from her long tenure at Green Mountain. And prior to that, so it was back in uh, yeah, 2019, she was one of uh, three new uh, 
Hawaiian Electric Industry board members, and she continues to be on the board. Uh, so yeah, Mary Mary's done a great job there, and her successors, of course, are doing a great job as well. Yeah. She did a great job in Vermont too, yeah. uh, clearly. But, but that leads to another point, and, and I think it's also worth mentioning is that in, in the time of COVID, uh, just as um, with uh, information technology and all these communication systems and social media platforms and all, people are interested in technology. And uh, I think they see, uh, they see solar as technology and especially solar storage. It's an expression of living better through technology. And so I think the whole pitch, you know, that the industry has made to the public about storage and also to the legislature, I should add, about storage has, has found a home now, literally. Um, and that people are doing this in part, at least in part, because they see the benefit of that technology joined with uh, existing solar technology. What do you think about that theory? Yeah, I do. And that kind of, you know, I'm going to riff a little bit on that. Uh, uh, Elon Musk, CEO of uh, Tesla, he did a, an earnings call about a month ago and also did so-called battery day, battery day. So I watched the earnings call, which is pretty extraordinary in and of itself. Uh, in COVID times. Uh, and then he and one of his associates essentially brought it, the world up to date, uh, up to speed on what Tesla's doing uh, in their approach to do two really important things, Jay. One is to bring the cost of these batteries down and two is to increase the energy density where you have more power per cubic centimeter of battery storage. And Tesla's taking the approach of essentially trying to capture the entire value chain, which is you know, having the land, owning the land, leasing land, where you can actually mine and extract the raw materials, aka lithium, and then going from the very beginning, which is the, the raw materials, right, and having a finished product. So, whereas other providers, uh, other produce, or other 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 users of battery storage, uh, are kind of being more uh, narrow in their approach, uh, here Tesla is all in, which doesn't surprise me at all from from Musk you know, yeah. to be able to control from start to finish because he sees, as many of us do, of course, that the way to go where we need to go is not just more renewables, more renewables, more or cost-effective renewables, I always want to add, but uh, exponentially more energy storage, both in terms of the transportation sector, but also in terms of stationary storage. And the only way he sees, you know, being able to hit his targets of millions and millions and millions of Teslas produced a year is to have more control over the whole process. So, you know, it's it's really this incredible frontier in terms of we need a whole bunch more, whole bunch more storage. And you see all these multi-billion dollar players from the United States and Japan and Europe and the Chinese who are all, you know, chasing after this stuff. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, it'll be make good things for, for competition and, and lower prices. Well, yeah, and you said, as you said, this is, uh, this is where we, where we want to go, where we are going. But where are we going? Uh, I, I, would, I need to ask you that. What does it look like in the future? If I give you a community that's loaded with um, solar and storage together, which is apparently the direction as revealed by, by the COVID time, uh, where does that take us in terms of your energy in our community? Well, it takes us to uh, a much more bi-directional uh, power grid, whereas the, the typical Edisonian model going back 100 plus years has been so essentially hub and spoke, right? You have big power plants and then the spokes uh, radiating from the power plant are sending power, in the case of the mainland, thousands of miles away, right? In this case, we've got you know distributed generation or distributed energy resources, whatever their other acronym you want to come up with, where you have many power plants spread throughout the grid. So it's, it's not the Edisonian model, it's, it's the so-called, and I, I don't like saying this phrase too much because it's so kind of ambiguous, but smart grid, okay, I said it's smart grid, where you have uh, independent power producers spread across the grid that are not only producing power, but storing power. And the, the, the utilities are gonna be less of a power producer. And this has been going on for the past 20, 25 years. They've been getting out of generation and more, more and more into transmission distribution where it has to be a much more you know, tightly choreographed uh, experience uh, in trying to manage uh, in our states, you know, hundreds of thousands, well, not hundreds of thousands, but close to 100,000 rooftop PV across our, our, our major islands. 
and and the Hawaiian Electric has gone on record in the past year saying we envision a, a, a massive increase of rooftop solar, as in 2x, 3x. And I, I, I applaud that. Uh, I do. We all do. And yet how you get there from here is really uh, is going to be something to to unfold. And it's, it's going to be and, and then you throw in hundreds of megawatts with hundreds of megawatt hours of, of utility scale projects, four of them on this island, multiple on Maui, multiple on Oahu, uh, Molokai as well, Lanai. And you've got utility scale with storage. You've got rooftop with storage. You've got power plants that are burning something for combustion, burning something in order to maintain a base level of, of reliability. So it, it's truly a new frontier here uh, that uh, I, you know, I'm excited to see happen, but it's also can be rather bumpy sometimes as well. Yeah, let's turn to the mainland again. Um, you know, I, you know I, the, the whole green energy thing was, um, mm, what's the word, discouraged, uh, but has been discouraged by the Trump administration. And things that might have happened during this four year period uh, didn't happen because he doesn't believe in climate change, he doesn't believe in green energy. I remember his uh, initial, uh, his initial uh, um, uh, encouragement for coal. Coal, would you believe it, coal? Uh, I don't think he's making that noise right now, but um, that, was, that was going on for a couple of years at least. And so now we, we turn, you know, we got a couple of people in Congress who care about it. Biden apparently cares about it. And um, it's, it, it, as you said, it's, it's a fair chance it's gonna change. We're gonna have uh, federal government uh, uh, encouragement, like incentivization uh, if Biden is elected. And, and certainly that would be a, a great and important thing. But the question is, how, how are they doing right now? Mm -hmm. How is green energy? I'm not necessarily limiting this to, you know, solar or batteries uh, on rooftops. Um, but how is green energy doing as an initiative right now? And if, you know, if we know what's going on right now, then we can better get a better prediction of what would happen in the future under Biden, hopefully. Well, let me, let me just mention coal briefly since you brought up the C word, Jay. Uh, for the first time ever, not long ago, if you look at global coal-fired coal electricity generation, compare that to renewable energy generation for the first time since these stats have been kept, going back, I don't know, industrial revolution, uh, renewable energy has, has surpassed coal. Coal is going down. No president of, of the United States or any other leader in the world is going to bring coal back in my opinion. Uh, so that that terminal crossover of renewable energy is now surpassed coal and that will continue to go up whereas coal must inevitably I believe go down. So that's a very, very good thing. Since you brought is, up coal, um, uh, I need to ask you where gas fits in all of this because I know the Trump administration is trying to sell uh, American natural gas all over the world um, and, and feels uh, that that's the future. Of course, this is a economic business transactional thing for him. Um, but, but the reality is there's a lot of money going into gas. Uh, where does gas fit between coal and renewables? Oh, some people call it a bridge, you know, bridge fuel. Uh, it's still releasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's certainly cleaner than coal. So if I had to choose one or the other, I mean, hands down, you go for nat gas. Interestingly, as you know, our governor you know, made a key decision a number of years ago, essentially turning down liquefied national gas, li liquefied natural gas, LNG, for the state. I think that was the right move at the time, saying, you know, we just, we need to avoid that bridge and just go straight to renewable. So uh, I, I see gas continuing to, to, to go up in terms of consumption. I, I don't follow the gas market too much today, but my hit is that gas prices are also quite low right now. And you know, we're, we're a major gas producer, but a number of other countries are as well. So there's a lot of politics, man. Oh, man. There's a lot of politics when it comes to gas and energy. There's a lot of money. Energy. Yeah. There's a lot of money involved yeah. in energy. And you can quote me on that. So, okay. So <laughs> what about renewables? What about green such as it is right now and green such as it might be? I mean, we, we, we're already to some extent green. It's already a good bet. But query, how well is it doing as, as opposed to how well it will do? 
Well, let me answer that this way. I think it was, you know, beginning of last year, I recall we did a show where we talked, we talked about the so-called Green New Deal, right? Green New Deal. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, right? She and, uh, and her uh, thoughtful uh, brood there, the Democratic Party in the, in the House came up with this very bold, very, very aggressive uh, Green New Deal, which was essentially uh, shelved by, by Nancy Pelosi. It hasn't seen the light of day, as far as I can tell, in the Democrat-controlled Congress since AOC spoke about it. But nonetheless, it's still, you know, Green New Deal, Green New Deal. And, you know, taking the politics aside, you know, it appears that uh, in a Biden administration, there would be a greater focus on renewables, which of course, how can I not but support, which I do. Uh, so that's the number of days or weeks or months off. So how are we doing right now? What we are seeing right now is if you look at kind of a, to me, a clear barometer of how renewable energy is doing, not just in this country, but on a global basis, look at some of the ETFs, the electronic trade fund, trading funds uh, that are, 100% exclusive into renewable energy companies, including module manufacturers, both foreign and domestic, power electronics, uh, foreign and domestic. And uh, how are they doing? Well, I mean, they beat the, the pants off of any type of S&P 500 or Dow Jones Industrial or, or pretty much any other ETF. Now, why is that? I think, uh, again, I'm not a stock analyst, but I've certainly got you know, some of my money in these ETFs because it feels good to do, number one, well, or, and at least a co-number one has been doing very well. So I think it's likely uh, that, that there's the buzz right now. There's a, whether it's a rational exuberance or irrational exuberance, uh, thanks Alan Greenspan, um, focus on ETFs that are renewable energy based. Uh, you know, you ask the question, how are we doing right now? They're doing quite well. I mean, Sunrun, uh, which has become the dominant player uh, in the U.S. after Solar City, aka Tesla, slid down. Sunrun, my goodness, you look at their stock performance for the past year, and they're up by six or seven x. You know, we're not talking 150 or 200 percent. It's six, seven, six to 700 percent x. So uh, there's clearly a running for the, not so much running for the doors, but a running for clean energy ETFs. Uh, so I think this is in prelude or in, in anticipation of a a possible, uh, dare I say, likely Joe Biden victory in, in 15 days that uh, uh, is seen to bode well for renewable energy companies and renewable energy public companies across the country and across the world. Yeah, now, so uh, last question is this, um, we talked about Hawaii, we talked about how, at least uh, theoretically, it sounds like people are interested in um, technology, interested in, you know, a, a better, more efficient world going forward. That's why they like solar, even in the time of COVID. That's, that's uh, even more so why they like batteries in the time of COVID. Um, and you know, it strikes me that if you look at the markets, look at the markets here and look at the mar markets on the mainland as you have described them, um, they're probably a reasonably good indicator, a likely good indicator of the world to come. The world to come after Trump, the world to come after COVID, COVID and Trump are really the same thing. The world to come after these times, these difficult times, okay? And the world, you know, like in information technology, you know, is, is going to be there in that world. Solar um, and batteries are gonna be there in that world. And renewables are gonna be there in that world. I think these, these markets, as we see them now, and as they, you know, as they, as they show strength in an otherwise, you know, relatively threatened market, are a statement of the future. And we can, we can see through them, we can see the future. Uh, and this, this discussion today helps me understand what the future looks like. What about you? What do you think? Yeah, I like that spin. I like that spin. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel like the, uh, the world, at least myself and a whole bunch of others are kind of holding our collective breath for yet another 15 days, right, hopefully. Inshallah, uh, God willing, we'll have a, a clear uh, result at the end of the day uh, uh, on the 3rd of November. But uh, I, 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 yeah, I mean, we have to, I have to, you have to, we need something to, uh, to look forward to and, and, and trend lines that are going in the direction we want to see, right, as opposed to off the cliff. So uh, renewable energy is, uh, 
is, has always been a part of, of uh, our existence on the planet. And I see, no pun intended, you know, bright future for renewable energy and, and for storage. And, you know, we, we live in a, this test uh, laboratory essentially here in Hawaii with our isolated islands with no prospect of inner island power cables anytime in my lifetime, most likely. So, you know, we've got a chance to, to do really wonderful, wonderful things uh, if we have the, the courage and the, the foresight and the, the, and the commitment to, to do it, not, not just in, you know, in the 25 years and, and a 100% renewable power generation by 2045. But I mean, geez, a lot can happen in 25 years and we need to get our act together you know what will more happen, better. What, what will happen is we'll have much more serious climate change, sea level rise, um, we'll, we'll yeah. have extreme weather. And I think that probably part of this, these trends that we're describing, these changes in you know, um, public thinking and in business thinking have to be folding in on climate change. They have to be thinking of that. Because although this administration denies it, and that's another show, um, but the fact is that people in general and business people don't deny it. And, and that part of the what do you want to call it, new appetite or um, the, the future appetite, the emerging appetite for more green energy is based on concern about climate change. Don't you think so? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yes, indeed. Well, uh, well I guess right, if we'll, be, we'll be on two weeks from today and imagine, imagine the, the drama that the, you know, the anticipation will be one day away from election day. Oh my God. We'll know a lot more then. Marco Mangelsdorf, uh, Energy 808, The Cutting Edge. Thank you so much for this discussion this morning, Marco. Oh, you're welcome. And then in the words of our friend, Fred, uh, Fred Rogers, I'll see you later, neighbor. <laughs>